I'm going to invite Max to come up. Well, thank you, guys. Um, I'm going to quick say a quick prayer, and then we're going to get started. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for Valley Church. Um, I thank you for all these people in here who are kind and gracious to one another, God. I thank you for our awesome staff, worship team, and just everybody in here that seeks to do your work, God. Um, I just pray that you continue to work here at the church, God, and that you would just uh, continue to show your face with all these people here, God. I pray these things in your son's name. Amen. I'm not going to lie to you guys. I don't know how I'm going to talk this morning <laughs> because we just had like the nicest little send-off thing for me, and so I'm feeling all different types of ways, and uh, I'm going to be all over the place. So I apologize for that in advance. Um, but for those of you who are standing in the room and you're like, who the heck is this guy on the stage? My name is Max DeKean. I am the student ministries director here at Valley Church, and you actually came on my last Sunday here at the church. So um, Valley decided that they were going to get their money's worth out of me and throw me up on the stage on the last day to do the message. And so this is you getting all of it right here. Um, uh, so before I just start going through the passage and going today, I just would like to quickly say that I am not only super thankful for the opportunity that I have to be standing on the stage and teaching in front of a church, which is, you know, praise God for that, but uh, I'd just like to say thank you because it wasn't too long ago, like it really actually wasn't too long ago that I was standing up on the stage and I was looking out and I was like, who the heck are these people? But now like... I'm standing here and I'm looking out and I'm going, wow, you know, I know people and I'm thankful that I have relationships with them. And, you know, there's been so much good that has happened here and it really is sad to leave the church. And I guess that's just a part of ministry, but I think that it is a good thing that I'm standing up here and I'm sad and I'm feeling things. <laughs> Uh, so I, I do praise God for the fact that I see people out there that I know, and I really never could have imagined the ways that God would use me here at Valley Church, and there's just been a lot to look back on. So um, with that being said, if you guys haven't talked to me or want to talk after the service, I will be here, but after today, it is my official last day, so that is it. Now, to transition rather abruptly, we are going to be continuing looking at the gospel account of John. This is a historical account of the life of Christ, and we are going to be looking at John chapter 18. But before you guys start busting open Bibles and stuff like that, uh, I just would like to quickly uh, review and take a look at where we are in the big picture of the life of Christ and the big picture of the Synoptic Gospels and this account uh, written by the Apostle John. Um, so, just to set the stage a little bit, over the last couple of weeks, we have been looking at Passover in ancient Jerusalem. That is what is going down during this time. Um, and as many of you probably know, this is the biggest celebration that the Jews had during that time. If you want to put yourself in there, everybody in the city at this time would be, you know, making preparations for Passover. I don't know what kind of decorations they have going on, but people are excited because this is a big week in the city. They're getting their sacrifices ready, uh, and they're all doing this on account of this symbolic meal that points both to God's past deliverance of his people and looking forward to his future deliverance of his people from death. Um, so keep that in mind as we go through the passage that we're going to look at today because it does play a big piece, and honestly, it's pretty ironic. Some of you are looking at the title and you're all, oh, okay, that's what we're talking about? You know what I'm talking about. Um, and so, as we've looked at over the last couple of weeks, uh, Jesus has actually just celebrated uh, this Passover meal with his followers, and he has pretty much given them somewhat of a final breakdown of the game plan uh, before they are heading out from there. So, after they finish this Passover meal, they head out into the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, I have a very bad <laughs> picture slash map of ancient Jerusalem. And you can see Gethsemane up there in the top right corner. Um, but they head out of the city to a very real place called the Garden of Gethsemane. And many of you know, and we just went over this, uh, Jesus here is praying to the Father concerning his fate. And then in this twist of events, he gets betrayed by one of his followers, Judas. And they come and they take Jesus away. Um, and so Jesus, who already knows that all of this stuff was coming, uh, was ready. He had predicted it many times, uh, but 
I just would like to point out that Jesus here is going to be having a long night. They pull him from the Garden of Gethsemane after the Passover meal, and then from the garden, they take him to the high priest, which you can also probably find on that map. It's the bottom one. Um, they take him to the house of the high priest, so they do that little trek, and from there, they take him to the palace of the Roman governor, which is the Praetorium, which you can see there. Um, we don't have this in the Gospel account of John, but Jesus actually goes from the Praetorium, and he goes over to Herod's palace where he gets tried by Herod, and then Herod sends him back to the Roman palace. So to set the stage here by like, and this is my rough guess, by like 7 o'clock in the morning, Jesus has been betrayed by Judas, denied by Peter, he's been mocked and dressed up by Herod, and we pick up today as he stands here now for the second time in front of Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor in the Praetorium. So that is where we are picking up in terms of setting today, and we are going to start by just looking at verses 28 through 32 here. Jesus is running on zero sleep. Starting in verse 28. Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanliness, they did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, What charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you, which is just a great response by the Pharisees. Pilate said, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anybody, they objected. And this took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death that he was going to die. So I want to stop there and just briefly pause for a second. Uh, in this first section of the text, the Jews take Jesus to be judged by the Romans. And before we actually get into this judgment, this trial that we're going to look at, John takes the time to point a couple things out that I just want to highlight. The first we can see in verse 31 and it's that the Jews tell Pilate, oh man, I'm already behind on the slides, sorry guys, I do this in high school ministry all the time too, so it's going to happen today. <laughs> you can look at them on the screen, but oh, no, I'm too far ahead, there we go. Um, anyways, in verse 31, the Jews tell Pilate that they have no right to execute anybody. So in Rome, obviously, you can't just go around killing people on the street. The Roman government reserves any right for public execution. But we know that this didn't stop the Jews every time. If you guys look forward to the book of Acts, you see that they stoned Stephen, and they didn't ask anybody for permission there. So they did this for a reason. And the second point that I want to look at very quickly is that they did this for a particular reason, and that reason was that they wanted him to be crucified. Verse 32 tells us this. This took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death that he was going to die the Jews did not just want Jesus to die. They wanted Jesus to do more than die. They wanted him to be cursed by God. In their mind, Jesus was the ultimate blasphemer. He was the one coming up and saying that I am co-equal with God the Father, and they resented that idea. But the Jews were not dumb. They were actually pretty smart, and they were familiar with the Old Testament law. They were so familiar that they knew a passage such as Deuteronomy 21, 23, um, which says, Their body shall not remain on the, all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day, for a hanged man is cursed by God. They saw an easy opportunity here to use Rome to curse God, and they took it. Um, but at that same time, they also neglected some of the other Old Testament prophecies concerning the Messiah's execution at the hand of his own people. So though these people couldn't answer Pilate when he asked them, you know, what charges are you bringing against this man? They wanted him not only publicly executed, but they wanted him to be cursed by God. Now, the second portion of the text is the bulk of the text, and it's going to be most of what we're looking at today. And it covers Jesus' actual trial before Pontius Pilate. So this is John's account of this trial. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did you talk to others about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it that you have done? Jesus said, 
My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leader. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason that I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of the truth listens to me. What is truth? Retorted Pilate. I'm behind. <laughs> um, with this, he went out again to the Jews gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against him, but it is your custom to release to you one prisoner at the time of Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. I want to start the breakdown of this passage just by looking at a quote that helped me after I had done the research and all that stuff, so I'm going to help you guys a little bit. This helped me synthesize the interaction between Jesus and Pontius Pilate, and it's actually a random quote. It's from Winston Churchill, and what he says is this. He says, men stumble over the truth from time to time, but most pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing ever happened. Here, Pontius Pilate, the Roman procurator, had an interaction with the truth on an early Passover morning in approximately like 30 AD, but he chose to ignore the truth. As we can see by looking at their conversation, Pilate doesn't seem to be too much concerned about the trial before him. He doesn't really care about the innocence of the dude that the Jews brought to him as much as he does the implications of this trial on his position. I just want to show you guys that in the text a little bit. Pilate's questions really do reveal his heart and his concerns. The first thing he says to Jesus is, hey, are you the king of the Jews? Like, that's crazy. It's clear that he wants to know the political standing of Christ before he starts to take any judgment calls on this guy. He wants to know, does he have power? How is this going to affect me? As the conversation continues, you can almost see Pilate's eyes light up when he responds to Jesus after Jesus says that he is from a kingdom not of this world. He says, so you are a king then. And then at the end of the chapter, when Jesus associates himself with the truth, Pilate makes this famous statement, and he says, you know, what is truth? To me, in that sentence, you know, Pilate might as well be saying, who cares about the truth? But from these examples, I think it is pretty clear that Pontius Pilate has priorities that are other than the truth. And this brings me to like the first major point that I want to discuss from the text. I know you guys don't have your handy dandy notes in front of you today, which is uh, my own fault. But uh, I would encourage you, if you would like to write notes, take tabs on these. This is the first point that I want to highlight. The gospel is the foundation for all truth. To reiterate that point, the gospel is the foundation for truth as we know it. Let's go over that. As we look at the Bible here, we see that Pilate ignored what he knew to be the truth during this trial. He may not have known that Jesus was the Son of God, but he knew that this guy was innocent and that he wasn't guilty before Rome. When looking at the full account of this in the Synoptic Gospels, looking at Pilate's trials in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we can see that Pilate declared Jesus not guilty six separate times. Yet now at the end, we are sitting here looking at Jesus going, okay, do you want this innocent guy or do you want the guilty guy? Here he is offering him up against Barabbas, a guilty guy at the end. Pilate entertained the mob in condemning an innocent man in the eyes of Rome because of the pressure that was placed on him by the Jewish elites. However, what he probably did not realize is that in standing against the truth in this immediate, specific context, he was taking a stand against all truth for all time. And that's the idea that I want to flesh out. During this trial, Jesus responds to Pilate in verse 37 saying this, In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of the truth listens to me. Track with me here. If the truth exists, which if you're going to deny, you're going to have to make somewhat of a truth claim, the truth had to come from somewhere, right? I think that it does. Logically, 
whatever is or was the source of truth, it then has to be the standard for all truth. For without a standard to compare something is true or not, truth will not and does not exist. In this passage, Jesus comes out with this crazy claim and he says, hey, everyone on the side of the truth listens to me. That's pretty outlandish. Imagine if I'm getting on the stage right now and I come up and I go, everybody on the side of the truth listens to me. I would hope that you guys would boo me out and maybe fire me even though it's my last day. Um, Earlier in the Passover, when Jesus was having this Passover meal with his disciples, he also made known to them this. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I just want everybody to see in these two examples from the Bible that Jesus is not shy about the fact that he claims to be this one standard of truth. He has already made the claim to be the Son of God, which is a big deal. Um, So if what he is saying here actually does hold up to reality and what we can observe, then Jesus quite literally would be the embodiment of truth itself. So I find it very ironic here that Pontius Pilate comes out with the question, what is truth? Because if Jesus is actually innocent in this situation and his, you know, his claims to be the king of the Jews are truthful in any sense, and Pilate is saying, yeah, I could get down with that, like, yeah, I agree with that, and he's supporting him in that, then by his own assessment, Pontius Pilate is having a conversation with the creator of all truth. So just to reiterate that one point that we were going over very quickly, the gospel message, Jesus' death and resurrection, if it can be proven, if it is, you know, empirically verifiable, is the foundation for all truth as we know it, because that would make Jesus God. Before I get going to the second large point that I have this morning, I just want to point out one more quick thing that stood out to me uh, about Pilate's response to the situation confronting him. Um, I think that he made it pretty clear, and when I envisioned Pilate saying that quote, you know, what is truth, I imagine it being like, you know, what is truth, you know, come on, like, we don't actually know what's going on here. But what I think that everybody in society needs to understand is that your perception of the truth is shaped by a primary authority, regardless of what you might think about that. Let's use Pontius Pilate as our, you know, example here. Although he's going, what is truth, and he's treating truth as if it's relative in this situation, his ultimate authority was really what was best for him. It was really just political correctness. What was true for Pontius Pilate, what was dictated by the mob, and that happens to be a very popular modern substitute for the truth. People like to just go with what everybody else wants to do, and they use that as their ultimate authority. So whether you yourselves are defining truth or you believe that the truth is being defined by a different primary authority, maybe other than God, all truth is shaped by belief in one way or another. And I think it's important that we remember that, especially when looking at texts like this. We as Christians believe because of our observations of the natural world that the truth is shaped, of course, by the God of the Bible. Uh, And so Pilate's interaction with Christ helps us to see that behind the truth, there is always a primary authority. Yeah. So I've only got two points for you this morning, so this next one's going to be pretty long. Um, But if you are writing down, here is the second point. This one's pretty easy to grasp. I'm sure you guys can all understand it off the bat. But I I believe that uh, Pilate's interaction with Jesus here shows us that there is no neutral ground when concerning the truth. Um, I think it's pretty evident right off the bat here that Pontius Pilate really didn't want anything to do with this situation right off the bat. First, he pretty much says something along the lines of like, hey, you know, you guys take this guy and judge him by your own law. He tries to dismiss it and let the Jews handle this problem themselves. And then when that doesn't work, we see in the account given by Matthew 
uh, that he tries to take the problem and pawn it off to Herod. So he sends him over to Herod, who had apparently wanted to see Jesus, and Herod goes, what, I got nothing to say against this dude, so I'm going to send him back to you. Later on in the text, we also see that he doesn't want anything to do with this, because after he's already come to a consensus on the trial, and some of you are familiar with this, Pontius Pilate goes over to the wash basin, and he washes his hands as if to say, I had nothing to do with this, like I made my judgment, and I didn't do anything here. I'm free of my decisions. But eventually, being the Roman procurator at the time, he is faced in having to make a decision regarding the truth. There really is nowhere for this guy to hide. At the same time, I would also like to note some of the language that Jesus uses in the conversation with Pilate. He forces him to deal with the truth. He forces him to come to the own, his own conclusion on the matter that is happening. In verse 33, John records this. Pilate went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus responds by saying this. Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did other people just talk to you about me? He's forcing him to come to his own decision. We see it again in verse 37. Jesus, uh, starting in verse 36, we see Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders, but now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. In fact, the reason that I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. As much as Pontius Pilate would have loved to remain neutral in his judgment, he had to make a decision regarding what he knew to be true. Was Jesus truly the king of the Jews? Was this guy standing before him innocent, or was he just another blasphemer, another zealot? I'm sure the Jews brought a lot of people to him and were like, hey, condemn this guy. Was he just another one of these guys, or what was he was saying true? There was no neutral ground here. As we know, his decision that he eventually made regarding Jesus had massive implications. Likewise, I think it is important to note that all truth, every truth that we find ourselves interacting with, has massive implications. It is a lie to think that we can be like Pilate and just dismiss the truth in a situation, whatever it might be. Um, Let me think of a bad example of that. Um, Say I were to leave Valley Church today, upholding or maybe dismissing the truth that you needed to drive on the right side of the road. I imagine that as I left the church and I took a right on the north selling, or a left, I guess, I don't know which way I'd be going, but uh, uh, I would be met rather forcibly with reality of the truth that you can't ride on the left side of the road. Uh, there would be some serious implications to the belief that I had concerning the truth. Um, The truth obviously isn't always as black and white as that. It can be a little bit more nuanced. Um, Another example that I wrote down here was that, uh, say I found it true to be that the high schoolers in our room were of lesser value than our esteemed adult congregation here. Um, Obviously, I could tell you that I would be at odds with all the high schoolers here and that they would probably draw a very different conclusion on what was true. There really is no neutral ground when it comes to drawing absolute truths. Um, And so John, in his account, records the final decision of Pontius Pilate in the passage that we read today. Um, When put face to face with Jesus himself, Pilate exchanges the truth about God for a lie And he simply just chose the thing that he wanted to do, saying, what is truth? Or to go back to my own interpretation of that, you know, who cares? There was no lawful reason for Pilate to condemn Jesus, yet he gave him over in what was the greatest mistake of justice that the world has ever seen. So to close us down today, every one of us faces a choice that is similar to Pilate's, not only today, but every day that we are alive when it concerns the truth. You can either acknowledge Jesus for who he truly is and accept him into your life, or you can reject him as Pilate did um, and choose to follow some other authority. 
Should the truth be that Jesus truly is the Son of God, that does have massive implications on our lives and our eternities. Um, so to reiterate this point that I've been trying to drive home, there is no neutral ground when concerning the truth, especially when it's the truth concerning the truth. Um, so I would encourage you guys, if you're sitting in this room today and you have not yet accepted Jesus as the truth, I would encourage you to ask yourself the question, why not? Ask yourself that question very realistically. Is it because you have solid empirical evidence that God doesn't exist and that this dude a couple thousand years ago was not the son of God? Maybe it's because of a personal philosophy that you might have held on to your whole life. Or maybe it's because you have some other authority in your life that you really just don't want to let go of. Um, I would encourage you to always pursue the truth and to not miss an opportunity to seek out the truth. And that goes for our believers in the room as well. If there is something that presents itself that seems to be true, follow that to its greatest extent. Everybody in the room must answer for themselves Pilate's inescapable question that he asks. It is, what shall I do with this Jesus who is called Christ? If you guys are sitting in the audience today and you have already determined in your own heart that Jesus Christ truthfully is the Son of the living God, be sure that the rest of what you believe falls in line with this reality. Be sure to pursue truth to its greatest ends. For where you find truth, you will find God, who is himself the embodiment of all truth. And so I'm way ahead of schedule right now, but I want to close our time not with just a word from Max. I would like to leave you with the words of Jesus himself. Um, and he says this, and I hope that this will be an encouragement to you. Jesus says this in John 8, 31. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Let that be an encouragement as we close today. I am going to say a quick prayer, and then... Uh, we're going to move on. Dear Lord, um, we thank you that we do have truth, Lord. Um, and we thank you that we can know truth, God, and we can know you by the truth, Lord. Um, help us to just look at the magnificence of this world, God, to look at the intricacy of design, God, to look at uh, the emotions that we experience, the, you know, the specifications of everything, God, and just to recognize that you are out there and that you have led us on a straight path to you, God. So please help us to trust you, to put you first in our lives and everything that we might do, God. Um, and I just pray that as we stay from the, stray from the truth, which we will, Lord, that you would be faithful to bring us back and that you would just help us to honor you with our actions, our thoughts, and just all that we do. Um, God, I thank you so much for this congregation here before me, God. Thank you for all that they've meant to me, God. And I pray that this would just be a place that the truth abounds, God, and that many people will come to know you because of Valley Church. Um, thank you again for your gift of today, and just be with us as we serve you. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. That's all I've got.